Okay. Good evening, everybody. Monday night, another uh, episode of Chumash. The beginning of the parsha, the Torah starts off by saying, "Emera lakayin beneyari." This very the, 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 this week's parsha discusses about who a kain is allowed to marry, who a kain gadol is allowed to marry, to whom they could become tame. You know, if they can become impure for certain people, Kayanim normally cannot become impure only for seven relatives. Kohen Gadol can never become impure. So there's a lot of uh, dinam about the Kohanim over here. But Dura starts off, Emer el Akayanim b'nei Aren. It says like this, speak or say, not speak. It's over here, it doesn't say by Yedaber. It's not an expression of speaking. It says, Emer el Akayanim. Say to the Kayanim Bene Aren, the Amarta Alehim, and you should tell it to them. So the Torah says, Speak, speak. So Rashi quotes famous Medrash, which is in three times, but we're not going to go into that tonight. Rashi says, Simply it means the older Kayanim are told to to educate the younger Kohanim in the laws, what they're allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do. Like we said, who you're allowed to marry, who you're not allowed to become impure for, and so on and so forth. So this is, by the way, a very fundamental aspect of what's called chinuch, of Jewish education. In other words, not only are the Kohanim obligated to learn the mitzvah by the, for themselves, but they also have to Teach it, Lahazit, to warn them the Gedele Malaktan. But the expression is an interesting expression. It doesn't say Lilamid Gedele Malaktanim or Lilmid Gedele Imaktanim. It doesn't say to teach. Lahazit means to warn, but Lahazit means to shine. Lahazit comes from the word Zohar. Like it says in Davening, like the shine of the, uh, the firmament of the heavens. The Torah is teaching us in these three words one of the most fundamental aspects of Jewish education. And that is when you teach children, there's only one way of doing it by shining to them, which means. It's not enough preaching to them. You can't talk to them. You could, but that's worthless if you don't show it, show it as a living example to shine for them that they should see you're living with what you're teaching them. In other words, you can elaborate on this uh, a lot. You can teach your children. We mentioned this many times. But this is the very, what well, doesn't apply today because everybody has their own cell phone. But under normal times when there was one phone per family, okay, we teach our children don't lie. We teach our children don't steal. Don't cheat. Don't beat the system. We teach our children don't beat the system. There's laws in place, keep to the laws. Then the phone is going to ring. Somebody, the kid answers the phone and they say, mommy, daddy, whatever, the phone calls for you. The parent doesn't want to speak to the person. Say, tell him I'm not home. Tell him I'm not home. What you basically showed in, in teaching, you gave a shining example that you're allowed to lie when it's convenient. You can preach and teach from today till tomorrow to next year that you're not supposed to lie. If you don't give a shine, live as a shining example, whether it's convenient or not, it's never going to get anywhere. To shine, how do you shine to them? Is only by showing a living example. There are many people who like to beat the system. Okay? Torah comes along and says, you're going to teach the children to beat the system. You're educating your children against Torah in a negative way. 
And you have many examples, whether it's the handicapped plaque or and the cars when you're not handicapped and the parents is convenient and the kids see it. What do you think you're teaching the kids? You're teaching the kids when it's convenient, cheat, lie, break the system, do whatever you want. This is what the Torah says, you have to shine as a living example. But now the question is like this. Why, if it's such an important thing, why does the Torah wait until here? The, the, the first time the Torah is teaching us mitzvahs, the Torah should tell us that you should teach the children. Why is the Torah all waiting all the way to this parsha? Right, the Torah is waiting to this parsha, and then over here the Torah says So there are many answers to the question, but one answer that Rebbe gives in a sikh like this. Parsha's emer is always read during the time of counting the Oymer. In fact, the mitzvah of counting the Oymer is in this week's Parsha. The mitzvah of counting the Oymer is mentioned in Parsha's Emer. Why is Emer, everything in Torah is exact. Why is this week's Parsha mentioned, always read during Sfira Sa'imer? And the explanation is because Sfira Sa'imer is the educational process to Matan Torah. Why, why is there a mitzvah of chinuch? Why is there biblical rabbinic different opinions without, without getting into that now? Why is there a mitzvah to educate the children in Torah? Because as Shlema Melech says, chanech l'nad al pidarke, educate the child in, in his way and his style, what he's able to handle. Kam kiaskin, that even when they get older, they'll never turn away from it. So what's the concept of chinuch? The concept of chinuch, the kids are not obligated in a mitzvah before baron bas mitzvah. They're not. The obligation of mitzvahs begins at baron bas mitzvah. The mitzvah of education, which is incumbent upon the parents, that mitzvah begins when the kid is six or seven, depending what, what, how mature they are and what mitzvah we're talking about. Audio? The yeah. basic, okay, I got it. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you very much. Basically, when the person is old enough to understand what the parents have an obligation to teach the kid. That's exactly what Sphere Sa'im is all about. Sphere Sa'im is all about getting ready, preparing ourselves, getting ready for Matan Teda. Just like Chinuch is a preparation for when they get older, when they become obligated in mitzvahs. So Sfira Sa'imer is the time of education, getting ready every year we get the Torah again, anew. But here you have interesting things. The Torah is speaking over here about Kohanim. Kohanim basically have the Kiddash them. There's a mitzvah in this week's parasha. You have to sanctify a Kayan. A Kayan is holier than the rest of the nation. Okay? Kadeshim Yilalakayan. They are holy. And from the opposite side of it, we're telling the Kayanim about not becoming impure, dealing with dead bodies. Very that's the ultimate impurity that exists even for a Kayan. That they cannot become Tomei to a dead body. What does this mean? When you're educating children, and the Rebbe, the Rebbe, especially the previous Rebbe, and our Rebbe, were very emphatic about teaching children all aspects of Tehidon. But Klau, there are many teachers when they get to, uh, I'm going to use a word, with the sexual parts of Tehidon, they skip it. The Yehudin Tamar story, they skip. Uh, the Yesen for Tifer story, they'll skip. And the rabbi were adamantly against it. It's Torah. The children need to be taught it properly. Not in, in a, because what you skip, the kids will read in the books, in the tray for books, and, and they'll get the wrong impression. Like this, you're teaching them according to Torah. But besides that, there are many educators 
they are still educated, but even more so in the previous generation, that maintained you shouldn't teach children the miracles of the Torah. You're going to tell them the sea split. You're going to tell them that the man fell from heaven. Come on, the kids are not going to believe it. The kids are not going to believe it. And therefore, all you're doing is making them not believe Torah. And the rabbi said, it's just the opposite. Children believe in the miracles of Teda. When you tell them that a miracle happened and you teach it to them in a way that you're shining with it, meaning the teacher believes in it themselves, the child believes it better than the adults because the adults have intellect that gets in the way of emuna, of belief, and trust that what the Tata says is 100% correct. And therefore, you need to educate the children. And Bechal, there's another interesting thing about Lahazik Velem Alaktanim. If you want to teach your children about keeping Shabbos, if you don't believe in it yourself, I'm talking about the teacher, if you don't believe in it yourself, that you shine with it, you will never teach it properly to the child. You want to talk to the children about Mashiach? If you don't believe in the imminent coming of Mashiach, that it's a reality, not Stama dream or folklore tale. If you don't believe in reality that Mashiach is imminently coming, you will never be able to teach that to your children. You will never be able to to, to, to teach it, to give it over to the children in a way that they will accept it. A salesman must believe in the greatness of his product, otherwise they're a lousy salesperson. Lahazik Delam Alaktan, the Torah is teaching us when it comes to levels of Kedusha Kayani, or for that matter, even mundane things, you know, Tuma and all that, you have to teach the children about it. What's holy, and what's impure, but the Torah is teaching us you have to lahazid gdelum alaktan. And that's why the Torah is waiting for the Pasha time of Svira Sa'imer. The whole Svira Sa'imer, Svira means to shine, like we spoke already. Svira means to shine. Svira Sa'imer means you're shining in a preparation for Matan Torah. Chinuch is to shine with a living example. In order to transmit to our children the authenticity of Torah mitzvahs, you must believe in it yourself. And if you believe that science is more correct than Torah, and when Torah argues with science, science is right and Torah is wrong, you will never transmit to the children the union of Torah. The whole concept of Lahazik Delam Akhtanin is to believe in the aspect itself. How are you going to be a shining example of living it? I mentioned a while ago in, the, in, in previous classes, after the war, and you hear this from a lot of people from, from that age group, so to speak. Many people came up over war, after World War II, they came to America. They were looking for jobs. Most In those days in America, you had to work on Shabbos. You had to work on Shabbos. Many people were looking for jobs and they were shame of Shabbos. They were shame of Shabbos. And they accepted the job. It came Friday. They told the boss, sorry, we cannot come in the next day. So the boss said, then don't bother coming in Monday. You're fired. I can't have somebody working five days a week. Sunday, nobody worked. And everybody was working, especially in the retail business down in the Lower East Side, whatever. Be the Shabbos, you need to work. And this went on. Jews, every week, were getting a new job. And there were two approaches to people at that time. And again, I heard this from older people. There were Jews that when it came Shabbos, they were in a rotten mood. And they said openly by the table, they were keep, eating Shabbos meal. They were Shem Shabbos. They said, ugh. Look at this. I lost in the job again. And again, I won't have a job. And I have to look for a new job on Monday. Look how it's terrible. 
none of those people's children remain Shemir Shabbos. None of them. There were Jews when they came Shabbos and they were fired Friday afternoon because they went home early for Shabbos and they came home by the table and they were spending Shabbos and, and the, fa the father would come by the table and speak to the children. He says, Baruch Hashem, we are able to keep Shabbos. Baruch Hashem, we're able to keep, even though Monday had to go look for a new job. But at the, what he shined at the table was not that Shabbos never is getting in my way. Shabbos is a burden and therefore I have to go look for a new job. What did he do? At the table, they were discussing Baruch Hashem, we're able to keep Shabbos. All of those children were Shemesh Shabbos. What's the difference? Both were Shemesh Shabbos. The difference is, well, are you shining? Are you enthusiastic about it? Are you living it? When a child doesn't see, doesn't learn from speeches, a child doesn't learn from preaching, a child learns from practicing. When a child sees that mitzvahs are important for a child, if a child sees, okay, I'm a rabbi in the shul, I have to speak of this. If a child sees that a father comes to shul and he doesn't talk and he's davening and he's into the davening and he's into the learning and he's into everything and he's behaving the way a Jew should behave in shul, that's when the child becomes influenced. That's when a child is going to be good in shul and daven. And sit next to the father or mother, penning boy or girl. But if a guy, kid, sees his father coming, comes into show, starts talking from beginning to end, and then the father says to the kid, go daven. Come on, it doesn't work like that. Because you're not lahazir b'deilim alaktanim, you are not shining with it. And this is a fundamental thing in every aspect of life, by the way. In being honest, in being menschlich, in going out of your way to help people. You can't tell your kid, go help somebody if you never do it. And that's why the Torah is waiting to Parshish Emma, which is right before Mat and Torah, because the Torah is teaching us that you need to have the introduction of Mat and Torah, to shine, even, and, and we know the, the carbon, the flower offering of Saita, and, and Eimer, that's why you learn Mesech the Seita during Sphere of Eimer, because they had something in common. All flower offerings in the Beis HaMikdosh had to come from wheat. All flower offerings anybody brought had to be from wheat, with two exceptions. Sphere of Eimer, the carbon Eimer, the flower offering was from barley, which the Gemara says is animal feed. A woman who was a saint that the husband accused her of you know, committing adultery. And you know, she had to bring the the the, the, the race, the water, you know, the ink and the water and so on. She had to bring a flower offering. What was it from? Barley. So over there, the Gemara says, why? She acted like an animal, so therefore she was immoral. So therefore, her her flower offering should be animalistic, an animal. Feed. Why is the carbon aim in the preparation for mountain potato from also from barley, which is the animal feed? So Chazal tell us because the whole accomplishment of mountain potato is to elevate the animal soul. The whole preparation of Sphira Soemir, which is by the way mentioned in this week's passion, not going off, because this is the mitzvah of counting the Aimer, 49 days, seven weeks which is the seven bad midas of the Nefer Shabbamis, of the animal soul. And each day, each midas is composed of seven. So you have seven weeks of seven days each, which is 49 days, which is the preparation for Matan Teda. What was the preparation? What is the preparation for Matan Teda? Dealing with the animal soul. The laws of Tuma, Not only the sanctity of Kohen, which refers to the amuna and holy things, but even the animalistic things. They need to shine as a living example. 
Another interesting mitzvah in this week's parsha, which is a very fundamental mitzvah, by the way, the Torah says, "V'nigdashti v'seich b'nei Yisrael." I have to become sanctified amongst the Jewish people. <clears throat> now, um, okay, it doesn't matter where it is. It's in this week's parashim. So, meaning I have to become holy. What does that mean? There's the biblical mitzvah, by the way, of Kiddush Hashem, of sanctifying the name of Hashem, which is halachically, the concept of giving up your life for the three cardinal sins, idolatry, adultery, and murder. These are the three sins that somebody is obligated to give up their life. And we learn it out from the positive in Yisrael, that a Jew has to be sanctified the name of Hashem. Okay, here it is. You should not desecrate my name. Chil Hashem is the worst possible of Ada. By the way, Desecration of God's name is a fourth category of tshuva that the Altrebbe doesn't even mention in Tanya. And he gets a tshuva, the Altrebbe says there's transgressing positive mitzvahs, is one level of tshuva. Negative mitzvahs is another category of tshuva. Then punishment of Kardas and Mitzvah Bezin, if it's capital punishment, it's a third level of tshuva. The Altrebbe doesn't even bring down the fourth level. Okay, very briefly. The first level, positive mitzvahs, you do tshuva, you're forgiven. Negative mitzvahs, you need tshuva and yom kippur. Capital punishment, you need tshuva, yom kippur, and punishment to get forgiveness. Then the fourth level is chilol Hashem, is a desecration of God's name, which by the way, I'll explain in a second what that means. Desecration of God's name, the Gemara says, Shuvah is not enough, Yom Kippur is not enough, punishment is not enough. The only thing that forgives a person for desecration of Hashem's name is four things together. Shuvah, Yom Kippur, punishment, and death. That's how bad Chilul Hashem. Hashem says you should not Make a chilul Hashem. And then the Pasuk says, the nigdashti b'seich b'nei Yisrael. And you should sanctify my name. What does the nigdashti mean? That's the level of, so to speak, Kiddush Hashem, which is the level of Mesidus Nefesh. Desecration of Hashem's name, Rebbe spoke about this many times, he quoted the Gemara. The Gemara says, chilul Hashem is not what you do. Chilul Hashem is not what you do. You could be doing something great. It will be interpreted by other people that are either not from or Goyim or other Jews, it doesn't matter. In a negative way, that's called Chilul Hashem. Especially when they say, oh, it's a Jew. Look at the Jew. Uh, you know, this is what they, the, the way they have, the way they, they behave. You know, we have all these incidents on the planes now, the throwing of Jews because there's no masks. You know what? The real question is who's to blame over here? But that's not for now. I'm not getting into the politics of it. But the bottom line is, Chil Hashem, the Gemara says, Rav Yehuda, famous Rav Yehuda of the Gemara, he said, if he was the Rav of the city, and he said, if I buy meat from the butcher on credit, because I'm the Rav who give me credit, in a place where nobody else can get meat and credit, it's a chilul Hashem. I, he's not stealing. The butcher's giving it to him on credit. But if nobody else gets credit, everybody pays for it. And the Rabbi Yehuda walks into the butcher store and takes a package of meat without paying for it on the spot. Rabbi Yehuda said that is chilul Hashem. It's desecration of God's name. Why? Because the impression is the implication is he's doing something wrong. To give you an example, if you cut somebody off and you look very Jewish and you cut somebody off or you butt a line or you do whatever, 
All that is Chilul Hashem. The opposite of Chilul Hashem, which I, don't, I didn't think of, we're going to talk about Chilul Hashem, is the Negdashti Besech Ben Yisrael. There's the sanctified. Now there's an interesting thing, a difference of opinion between Rambam and the Medrash. Rambam writes that Mesiris Nefesh is when a person is ready to get killed and he's not relying on a miracle. He doesn't, he's ready to get killed and he gets killed. That is, according to the Rambam, the ultimate level of sanctifying the name of God. There's a medrash in this week's parsha. Amr Abchir Rabchir says, no, Mesiris Nefesh means I'm ready to give up my life when I'm expecting a miracle to happen. Like we know the famous story, Hananiah, Mishal, and Azariah were thrown into the fire and Nebuchadnezzar threw them into the fire and, and they came out alive. The, a miracle happened. The Medrash says, that's the ultimate level of Kiddush Hashem, when a miracle happened. And the Ramam says, no, the ultimate level is when a miracle doesn't happen and you talk about it. Okay? So each one has its advantage and disadvantage. But there's no question that the attitude of Mesiris Nefesh means I'm ready to give up my life. I'm ready to give up my life for the sake of God's name, not to desecrate Hashem's name, to, to, to bring, publicize God's name in the world, like Avraham Avinu. And this itself, you have two levels in the Siddhas Nefesh, another two levels. The Gemara says, when Rabbi Kiva was being tortured, because the Romans made a decree and not allowed to learn Torah, And Rabbi Kiva was still learning Torah. So one of his students came to him and said, you know, why are you learning Torah? They're, they're going to catch you. They're going to kill you, the Romans. So he gave the famous analogy, you know, the, the fish is in the water and the fox says to the fish, where, where are you running from? He said, from the fisherman's nest. He said, come on the dry land and you'll be safe with me because the fox wanted a meal. And the fish said, you stupid fox, what you are. You're supposed to be smart. In the water, I have a choice of an option being alive or dead. If he catches me, I'm dead. If he doesn't catch me, I'm alive. If I come out of the water, for sure I'm dead. So basically, I've been keeping told the students, I have no choice. If I leave Tait, I'm dead. Okay, if I'm learning Tait, they might catch me, they might not catch me. Then the Gemara says, when they finally caught Rabbi Kiva, Rabbi Kiva was one of the 10 martyrs that were killed by the Romans. So we read about the Yom Kippur, Mosef, and the Tishabov in the, in the Kinnis. One of the 10 martyrs, they were actually ripping his skin off him. They didn't shoot him and kill him or kill him with an arrow or whatever. They tortured him to death. And Rabbi Kiva was smiling. Rabbi Kiva was happy. And the students said to him, the Gemara says, Rabbi, how can you be happy that you're dying? So Rabbi Kiva said to them, my whole life had a mission. My whole life, even if they kill you. That's what we say in Shema. Rabbi Kiva said, my whole life, I was waiting to have Mesidus Nefesh, literal Mesidus Nefesh, for the sake of Hashem. Now that it finally happened to me, my goal is, is happening. My dream goal is happening. I shouldn't be happy. So Mesidus explains that we keep a tremendous Mesidus Nefesh. But Avram Avinu's Mesiris Nefesh was even greater than Rabbi Akiva's. Why? Rabbi Akiva looked, wanted, was dying, excuse the, excuse the pun, 
He was dying for Mesidus Nefesh. He wanted it. And that was his form of completeness, so to speak. That was something that completed him. Now he reached his goal. Chassidus explains, Avram Avinu also had Mesidus Nefesh. He had 10 tests. He was thrown into the fire. I mean, a lot of terrible things happened to Avram. He, he had Mesidus Nefesh. But Avram Avinu didn't look for Mesidus Nefesh. He didn't want the completion to be a complete person by, by having Mesidus Nefesh. And Chassidus explained, what, but, but what? Avram Avinu had a mission. His mission was to spread godliness in the world. That's my mission, my goal. If Mesidus Nefesh is demanded, I'm ready. If it's not demanded, I'm not ready. What I'm, there's no me. I'm not looking for my ultimate completeness of having the Siddhas Nefesh. By the way, Rabbi Kiva is a super, super holy level. But Chassidus explains the difference between Avram Avinu and Rabbi Kiva's Mesidus Nefesh was Rabbi Kiva looked for it and Avram Avinu had it, but he didn't look for it. If he didn't need it, he didn't want it. He didn't want to die. He wanted to live. In life, we also have that type of Mesidus Nefesh but in a completely different way. We just learned in Tanya Wednesday night, past Wednesday night, that, you know, the lowest of low is ready when it comes to idol worshiping, he's ready to give up his life. Now, Treb explained in Tanya, every sin is idol worshiping, and therefore every sin you should have Mesiris Nefesh and give up. But now Treb says, over that Mesiris Nefesh, of not sinning, doesn't mean to die. Mesidus Nefesh, that the Pasuk the Nigdashti, the Seich B'nai Yisrael, is the biblical source for Mesidus Nefesh. Mesidus explains Mesidus Nefesh means giving up your will. Nefesh, Mesidus brings Sukim, but takes a Nefesh on my derech, a Nafshi ba'amazeh. There's Psukim in Chumash and Tanakh that the word nefesh actually means my desire, my will, what I want. Mesidus nefesh means giving up my will for what Hashem wants. That's what Mesidus nefesh means. Today, we don't live in a world where the midst of the Nikdash, in most parts of the world at least today, that we have a, to keep Yiddishkeit with a threat over our head that we got to be we're going to get killed. That doesn't exist today. What does exist today is giving up our desires, our Mesidus Nefesh, giving up what we want versus what Hashem wants. And that Mesidus Nefesh is called sanctification of Hashem's name. Today, we don't need to jump off buildings. We don't need to do any crazy things to Mesidus Nefesh. What we need to do, Mesidus Nefesh, is give up our will for what Hashem wants. And as Alter Rebbe says in Tanya, it's infinitely easier than dying in, in giving up your life. So therefore, that's the level of Mesidus Nefesh, not to do miracles, not to do it for miracles, not to do it for reward. Do it because this is what Hashem wants from us. Okay, another thing about Sphere of Amen, and this is a general question. Remember, we Bacham used to go out to speak for various conservative reform temples. So one of the questions, this was in the, in the later 60s, one of the questions in the early 70s, one of the late the questions they always asked, there's no individuality in Torah and mitzvahs. There isn't. Everybody puts the same tefillin, everybody lights the same Shabbos candles, everybody keeps Shabbos, everybody does davening, the same text of davening, and everybody does. Where is their individuality within Torah? And they used to say, there isn't any. And I want to, sir, I want to be an individual. I want to do it my way. I don't want to copy everybody else. 
I want a relationship with God in my own individual way. So what's the answer to that? The answer to that really, to elaborate on is in today's part. What's the mitzvah sphere of Sa'imah? You count the Eimer, okay? There's a few countings. Teres says in Chumash. Bezdin has to count the sabbatical year Shemitah. Then the Torah says, you count the 50th year, that's the Yevil Jubilee year. There's a lot of countings in Torah. And then there's the counting with Svartam Lachem, which means Svira Sa'imet is an individual counting. It doesn't say Usfartem, just count. Usfartem Lachem, Halacha says, means that every Jew has their own counting of the Oymet. And by the way, I don't want to elaborate on this now, but whoever is in Shul Pesach time knows it has a very strong, in fact, somebody called, it, called me about it today. When you count your own Eimer, so basically all people are counting the same Eimer, but not necessarily. Because if somebody, let's say Australia, is let's say 17 hours ahead of LA, okay? If, if it's 17 hours ahead of LA, so tonight we counted 24, but they're already counting 25, because they're much later than us. So what happens if somebody travels from here to Australia or from Australia here? What do they do? They're basically missing a day or gaining a day. So the Rebbe maintains emphatically, by the way, and many people disagree, but the Rebbe maintains emphatically. Svira is a personal counting. You have to count your own counting. That means if you come from America to Australia, Australia to America, you're going to be counting a different day than everybody else in your city. If you were in Australia for Pesach, the guy called me today about that. He was in Australia for Pesach and came to LA in the middle of Sfira. So we counted tonight 24. Tonight he counted 25. Because Sfira is a personal counting, not a communal count. Then the Rebbe says, and this is where the bigger problem is, Shavuos is dependent on your counting Oymet. It's not, it's the only holiday. It's interesting. It's the only Yom Tif. The Torah doesn't say when it is. Pesach, the Torah says 15th of Nisan. Sukkah is 15th of Tishrei. Rosh Hashanah, 1st of Tishrei. Yom Kippur. Every holiday, the Torah says when it is, except Shavuos. Torah says that the day after Pesach, you count 49 days and the 50th day of Shavuos. According to our calendar, that Nisan has 30 days and Iyad has 29 days. So then the 49th day, the 50th day, is the 6th of Sivan, which is Matan Taylor. What happens though if somebody's a day ahead? If they're a day ahead of Svira, they're going to make Shvuas on the 5th day. Or if they're late, they're going to make it on the 7th day. And that's what it says in your Shalmi when they did it not based on the calendar. They did it based on the testimony of, eight, of witnesses. Then Nissen could have had 30 days and Ir could have had 30 days. Then Pesach would be on the 5th of Sivan. I mean, Schwartz would be on the 5th of Sivan. If both months had 29, it would be on the 7th of Sivan. Matan Torah has nothing to do with that. It so happens, according to our calendar, Matan Torah happens to be after the 49th day of the Oymet. And for instance, according to the Rebbe's opinion, if a guy came from Australia here where they, they're a day ahead, okay, he's going to keep Shavuos a day before us. So this year, Shavuos is Sunday and Monday. He's going to keep Shavuos, Shabbos and Sunday. Monday for him is a regular weekday. But he cannot say his man matan teira seinu until the sixth of Sivan. Even though Shavuos is for him the fifth day of Sivan, but he can't say matan because it's not matan teira. Matan teira is the sixth of Sivan. What do you see from all this? It's a remarkable concept. I know it's a, let's bring it down to earth. 
There's an counting the Omer is personal counting. Shavuos is the Yom Tif for everybody. Matan Torah. Yes, every Jew puts on the same tefillin. But no two people put it on the same way. I don't mean the action of the tefillin. That, yeah, you either Ashkenazic, Sephardic, put the shin here, 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 whatever. doesn't matter. The way I put on tefillin is not the way you put on tefillin. Why? You have enthusiasm. You have excitement. You enjoy doing it. That's your individuality. That counts more than the mitzvah itself. The mitzvah itself is the individuality of the kavana, the enthusiasm, the intensity of the mitzvah. That is where the individuality counts. Why is that so much important? Why is that so more important than perhaps the mitzvah itself in a certain way? Because like Dr. Rebbe explains in Tanya, you have a mitzvah, that's like the body of the bird. Halachically, you, you take off you take off the wings, clip the wings. The bird is still a kosher bird. You could shecht it and eat it, it's fine. What do the wings of the bird do? They make the bird fly up. What are the two wings of a mitzvah? Love and fear. Love is the right wing. Left uh, Fear is the left wing. You can't fly with one wing either. You want a mitzvah to be connecting you to Hashem? You need, you it, need to have the kavana, the intent, the love, the fear, the enthusiasm, the vitality, the excitement of a mitzvah. That's what makes, and that's where the individuality is. The whole preparation of Matan Torah is individuality, the counting of the sphere, the shining as an individual, like we spoke before, sphere means to shine. The enthusiasm of a Jew getting ready for Matan Torah by shining in the animalistic, like we said before, the animal food, to elevate the Nefesh Habamis, no two people are alike. No two people are alike. We mentioned once before, a few times before, in different places, in Hasidic books, so to speak, not Sichas in my modern, but it's called the Arum of Hasidus, you know, the Hasidus uh, atmosphere. It says, Arav, Ruvain asks a Shaila and Shimon asks the same Shaila, they're going to get the same answer. You're either allowed to do it on Shabbos or you're not allowed to do it on Shabbos. Right? Because that's halacha. Halacha is yes or no. It's clear cut. You could do it or you can't do it. A Rebbe, you're not supposed to say lahavlo between Jews, but a Rebbe, on the other hand, no two people get the same answer. Because a Rebbe is looking at Neshama. Neshama, no two people have the same neshama. Every neshama is total individuality. And therefore, when the Rebbe answers somebody who asks a question, the Rebbe is not answering the question. The Rebbe is answering the person. It's a big difference. Many times, by the way, a Rav also needs to answer the person based on what the person's level is and so on and so rather than the answer. But a Rebbe never answers the question. The Rebbe always answers the neshama, the person. It's not the question, it's the person. And no two people are the same. If no two people are the same, no two people are going to get the same answer. What's good for you is not good for them. I is the same thing. For them, it's good for you, it's not good. That's the individuality of Svira Sa'imir, by the way. The individuality of Svira Sa'imir is the preparation for Matan Teda for each person to shine on their own unique individual level of a fulfillment of mitzvahs. And therefore, there is total individuality in mitzvahs. We're not doing the same mitzvah. The act of the mitzvah is the same. 
But the mitzvah is completely different. The nefesh, the person is doing the mitzvah two different ways. And therefore, this is the simcha that a person has, the enjoyment, that is the individuality. And that's why Sfira Sa'imet, the individuality of working with our midas, of the animal soul, that's the preparation for Matan Teira, that Matan Teira should, which is equal by all Jews. But the third thing, it's not the same because your preparation got it this way and your preparation got it this way. And therefore, what happened by Matan Teira? It's another remarkable thing. When God gave the Ten Commandments, he said, he spoke singular. Not one of the Ten Commandments is plural. Not Each one of the Ten Commandments is spoken Lashin Yochid. And there's a lot of reasons Chazal tell us. Want to protect the Jews, whatever. The main point over here is because a Jew shouldn't think that, first of all, Jews, <laughs> Jews have another tendency. When you tell them to do something you don't, they don't want, they think you mean somebody else, not me. You imagine if Hashem said, plural, I am God, you're God. Everybody said, yeah, he means everybody else. So that's plural, it doesn't mean me. Hashem says, Hashem what is Ten Commandments saying in singular? Because Hashem says, I am your God different than that person's God. Not, if there's someone I'm saying, not that God forbid it's a different God. But your relationship with God is different than somebody else's relationship with God. You might be doing the same mitzvah. You might be both putting on tefillin or lighting Shabbos candles. But this is a one type of a connection with Hashem, and this is another type of connection with Hashem. So the answer to, to the question, where is their individuality in Torah mitzvahs? There is total individuality in Torah mitzvahs. It might be doing the same mitzvah. We might be eating the same food, but every person is eating it differently. Every person is fulfilling the mitzvah completely different than another person. And that's where you have individuality in Teira Mitzvahs, and therefore that's the uniqueness of Svira Sa'im as a preparation for Matan Teira. Okay, another thing, it says by Svira Sa'im when Torah says about counting the Eimer, the Torah says Sheva Shabbat says to me, my stihiyana. They should be complete. Seven complete weeks. Okay. So, what does it mean, complete weeks? This is a very interesting thing. The Pasuk over here says, in this week's Pasha, you should count from the day after Shabbos. That's the literal means. Rashi says, what does Shabbos over here mean? Mimachris Yomtev. The second day of Yomtev, you start counting. Because in Israel, they kept one day Yomtev. Usfartem nochem mimachris says Shabbos. Here, Shabbos doesn't mean Shabbos. The Gemara says, it means Yomtev. Shabbos, Yomtev is also called Shabbos. The Tzedukim, the Korites, who did not believe in the oral Torah, they said, the Torah says you count Shabbos, Sfira, from the day after Shabbos. They counted always Sfira on, on Sunday. Saturday night was the first counting of the Emir Badam always. Because he said, the Pasuk says Shabbos. We know, not true. Memorial says Shabbos means the second day of Pesach. So the Gemara says an interesting statement that when are they really Tamimis? Like this year, by the way. This year, Sunday is the first day of the week in Oymet. 
because we began counting the Omer the second night of Pesach, which was Saturday night. Shab Pesach this year was Shabbos and Sunday. So Saturday night, we began counting the Omer. That's why every Shabbos finishes a week this year. So the Gemara says, one interpretation of Tamimais means complete weeks that start on Sunday and end on Shabbos. That's one interpretation of the word Tamimais, Tiyan. Now, another interpretation, it says, um, the Medrash says, that, that was the Gemara in Menachos. The Medrash says, what does it mean they should be complete? What do you mean to be complete? The Medrash says, they should, the, they should do the will of God. What does it mean complete? You should do the will of God. By doing the will of God, the Gemara says, what is the reward for that? It says, Va'amdu Zarim, the Pasik says, Va'amdu Zarim, when Mashiach's era, foreigners will stand, and they'll take, they'll graze your sheep. Meaning the Pasik says, when Mashiach comes, Jews will sit and learn Tera a whole day. All the other nations are going to be serving the Jews. That's what the Pasik says. When Mashiach comes, Va'amdu Zarim, Va'amdu the foreigners, meaning the non-Jews, will come and they'll uh, graze your sheep. So the Gemara asks, one minute. It says in the Pasuk, in Shemaya Tishma, if you listen to Hashem, you will gather your grain. You will gather the grains. So the Gemara says a contradiction. One Pasuk says the, the nations are going to do things for you. And another Pasuk says you're going to do it. So which one is it? So the Gemara answers. One Pasek is speaking when they do the will of God. One Pasek is when they're not doing the will of God. When you do the will of Hashem, the foreigners are going to take care of everything. You don't do the will of Hashem, then you're going to have to do it yourself. So the question is, one minute. That Pasik, the Safta Duganach, we say three times a day in Shema, is in the second paragraph of Shema when it says, im if you will listen to my mitzvahs, then Vasafta Duganach. That means you're doing the will of Hashem. How can the Gemara say that the Pasik, the Safta Duganach, is speaking when you don't do the will of Hashem, when it says in the Pasik, im Shemaya Tishmu? So the, Gemara, the answer is, why is the second parsha of Shema not doing the will of God, even though it says Shema Yatishma, you're listening to the mitzvahs? Because in the first parsha of Shema, it says, B'chol Avavcha, B'chol Nafshecha, or B'chol Me'idecha. Me'idecha means with all your might. Breaking your barriers, breaking your nature. In the second parsha, it says, "Im shemayat tishmu, la'avas Hashem alokechum ulaavdei b'chol levavchem or b'chol nafshechem." But it doesn't say b'chol meitchem. So the Gemara says that when is it called doing the will of Hashem in the first parsha of Shema when they break the nature b'chol meidecha? When is it? Not doing the will of Hashem when you don't have Bachom Eidecha. You don't have all your might. You're not breaking your nature. You're not going above and beyond what you're accustomed to. Of course, what does that mean? So Chsidis explains that God is infinite, we're finite. Okay, how could the finite reach the infinite? Okay, you do a mitzvah, but we're finite people. How can we do a mitzvah and reach the infinite because we did a mitzvah? How does it work? Mathematically, it doesn't make sense. The answer is, and that's all concept, you see us mitzvah going out of bounds and limitations. The Torah says, when you break your nature, 
when you break your nature, within the realm of finite humanity, you are reaching the infinite because you broke your nature. Our nature is what we are. That's finite. Finite is our nature. You go above and beyond, you learn a little bit extra. You dive in a little bit better. You give a little bit extra to stuff. You do whatever. That break, when it's difficult and you break your nature, that actually called Eisen Ritzene Shemakim. What does Eisen Ritzene Shemakim mean? Simply it means you do the will of a God. But the Rebbe explains it to mean Eisen Ritzene. You do the will of God shall mock him to bring it into place. Meaning, what is the purpose of a mitzvah? To bring the infinite God into the finite world. To bring the infinite God into the finite human being. says, You make the will, and Chassidus explains even more. Aisin Ritzayna Shemakim is defined in English as they do the will of Hashem. Chassidah says, Aisin Ritzayna Shemakim means you make the will of Hashem. You create the will of Hashem. What does that mean? What is the will of Hashem? Dira B'tachtenem, to exist, revealed as is in a low physical world. That's what Hashem wants. Who makes that happen? Who makes the essential infinite God reveal itself in a finite world? We do. When you do a mitzvah. So when the mitzvah is easy to do or it's natural to do, it's habitual to do, so then you're not breaking yourself. You're still within your realm. You can't find the limitations. That doesn't do it. You know what the Gemara says? Of Tamimais, you know what completeness is? Ultimately, when you combine the infinite with the finite, how is that possible? When you do a mitzvah, when you do a mitzvah, with breaking your nature above and beyond what you're accustomed to do, when it's difficult to do the mitzvah and you do it anyway, that causes a completeness of connecting infinite and finite. And that's the only way it could be done. And just to close with this point, therefore, by in this week's parsha, by Amen, the Torah says, "Kispru chamishim You should count fifty days. Kispru chamishim count fifty days. The but Gemara asks, but we only count forty nine days. Shiva shavuos. Torah says count seven weeks, which is 49 days, and then says count 50 days. Is it 49 or is it 50? The answer is, I mean, you can elaborate a lot on this, but it's not shown. When a person refines himself and all 49 levels of their soul, of the animal soul, and they do the best they can, and they are ready to go out of the nature, you get the 50th level of Kedusha that nobody got, not even Meshul Rabbeinu in his life, they never got that level. The Gemara says in Rosh Hashanah, he only got 49 levels of Kedusha. But the Chasreo Ma'at Melekim, it was missing a little bit, but God, the Gemara says in Rosh Hashanah, God created 50 levels of Kedusha, 49 levels were given to Meshul. The Maggid said, he died, he was buried in Har Nevoi, Nevoi is Nun, but he reached the 50th. After Matan Teira, when a Jew does the work by breaking, going out of the bounds and limitations of Nef Shabbat, it's of the animal soul, then we get the gift from above, the infinite level, the 50th level, which symbolizes the eternity. Ad Elam, eternity is 50. The Gemara's Pasik says in Chumash. Then we reach the ultimate level. And these are all some of the lessons of this week's Parsha. There's a lot more, but anyway, that's it for tonight. Mitzvah Wednesday, don't forget. Uh, 8.30, Allah and Tanya. Everybody should have a great week. Tonight's Amir, as we mentioned before, was 24. Don't forget to count the Amir. And hopefully we'll see you Wednesday night and have a very good week. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye. Good night.